Hi there everybody, welcome to Ice to Sea TV. Really excited to have you all today. This is um, another interview I've got for you. I'm really excited about this interview. Um, I would say this is my oldest friend, but I've not known him very long. Um, it's a Rick Joyner joke. Hopefully you appreciate that. Um, today we are going to be looking again at the prophetic and just trying to really, how can we... Um, connect with the prophetic better and connect with each other better so i want to bring you show invite you my guest on which is my friend here hey there how are you doing sir so um i've literally forgotten your name <laughs> that's a good start we're leaving that in in the glory that's a great start this is matthew klein uh, my friend from Canada. So, sir, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your bio? What's your history? You know, go for it. <laughs> they came to the Lord when I was about seven. Um, we immediately were involved with the uh, charismatic movement. So um, that was back in the uh, oh, very late 70s and uh, kind of grew up in a charismatic church, um, went to a charismatic Bible school, uh, went to a Christian school in the basement of that church, was in church four nights a week. And the church we were at was very cutting edge in the prophetic um, and uh, about 1500 people tucked up here in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada, and um, and the pastor was always bringing in guest speakers, so we had tons of exposure to the prophetic. I don't know if you remember Dick Mills back in the day, big barrel-chested uh, prophetic guy. I've, I've, I've heard about him, but Bill okay. Johnson talks about him. Okay, yeah, and man, that guy knew the Bible better than I've seen anyone, you know, back wow. in the day where they would record your word on a cassette tape, you know, just record <laughs> play and say, <laughs> And you get your little tape at the end, but he would just rattle off scriptures and you'd just be trying to keep track. And wow. so that, uh, that probably was my first really big exposure to the prophetic other than, you know, every once in a while we'd have somebody stand up in church and yell in tongues and then somebody would guess what they were saying. Um, you know, and it would often be, <laughs> it would often be bless my people. Oh, my people. I love my people. You know, it's like, well, and I always remember thinking, yeah, I think we already know that. So thanks. Thanks for the word, Holy Spirit. We're all caught up, you know. So, it's like, so these were the really beginning days of the prophetic <laughs> movement, and everyone just kind of taking their shot at stuff, you know. So it was, uh, it was interesting. I've actually learned a tremendous amount, and I don't want to digress too much, but that whole thing about one of the gifts of the Spirit being interpretation of of tongues, and I've always thought that's the crappiest gift, you know. If you take all the gifts. No one wants that one. That's like, ah, uh, you know, on those Christmas gift exchange, you get interpretation of tongues. You're like, yeah, I'll, I'll trade with yours. I'll, I'll take the gift of healing instead. I don't want the interpretation. Because when are you using that? On the bus? You know, like there's never, there's never a time. First, you got to be in a crazy enough church that someone's going to get up and yell in tongues. <laughs> and then you're going to have the interpretation. So there's just. I just saw there was no point to it. And I was actually praying about it one day. I said, Lord, there's got to be more to this that we don't understand. Yeah. And and it was really interesting because, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Greek, right? And uh, I, I don't read my Bible without Greek now because it just, there's just too much that you miss. So I was, I felt the Spirit say, you know, you know what this word means. And it's glossalia, which means language. So it's the gift of interpreting spiritual languages because it's a gift of the spirit. So, so then I felt the Lord asked me, what are the languages of the spirit? And I thought about it for a minute and I thought dreams and visions, dreams and visions are the languages of the spirit. And mm -hmm. so the gift of interpreting the languages of the spirit is the ability to interpret dreams and visions. Right. And so and lo and behold, the gift that I really didn't like is something I've been operating for years. I, I'm, I'm really big into dream interpretation and vision interpretation and have visions all the time. So I thought, 
oh lord actually it's one of the best gifts you know i i really like that one anyways total side note but that's kind of my upbringing um around it so that's cool so really yeah. you've been involved in the prophetic movement for a long 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 time then you know so yeah since it deep started roots, deep roots yeah yeah and then i was an itinerant speaker youth pastor for years and then eventually uh, uh my wife and i decided to plant a church uh the refuge so we've been doing that for 10 years and awesome. um yeah so we do that we often she'll prophesy right during worship or I work it into my messages or every once in a while, I'll just call someone out in the middle of preaching mm. and just give them a word. Um, or, uh, or we have separate nights where we just focus on worship and then doing prophetic ministry with people. So That's we do, awesome. we've done that on and off for the years. Yeah. And then we train other people to operate it. So we, we get really big on group prophetic ministry where yeah. it's not just me or or my wife you know ministering to everyone we kind of get people in groups and we just model it yeah. um and then show them and then we, we someone sits in the chair and then we just we just sit with them for a while until people get a picture a word and all of that uh, is prophetic so and then we say don't don't give more than you have and be yeah. bold enough to give what you have no matter how incomplete it it is so yes that's yeah. good so you know absolutely. what is, is I, I find quite fascinating about you um is i know you are let's for want of a better word a grace guy for for want of a yeah. better and what i find fascinating is you've managed to hold on to your the the the, the, the things of the spirit and right. become yeah. reformed in this area of grace and honestly yeah. i've not met many guys or girls like that and so yeah. I find that fascinating because I'm like that. I'm a total grace guy, but I'm also was quite desperate to hold on to the things of the spirit because I yeah. saw as people got deeper into the theology of grace, they seemed to lose that encounter and experience yeah. and it got diminished. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've really experienced that. And in fact, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, but, but here's what I've discovered, right? That, there were a lot of people in the grace movement, I think, that have evangelical background or Baptist background that don't already believe in the baptism of the spirit, don't have exposure to, you know, intimacy and in worship and the prophetic. And so the, the funny thing is, is if you fast forward, you know, the 30 years from now, the only people left doing grace ministry that we're talking about will be charismatics because the rest of them will be atheists and agnostics because that's what seems to always happen right because i don't know how you go through deconstruction without the anchoring of the spirit right come on because i was able to let go of so many bad theologies and doctrines because at the end of the day i was connected to spirit right so because the spirit would say to me you yeah. know even when i had to deal with really difficult things like what is the word of god and it's like the holy spirit was like well well jesus is right and so even that fundamentally was so hard because then i thought well i've lost all objectivity then and so i i just felt again that the spirit come and say okay but do you love people more yeah come on you know do you are you more long-suffering and kind now yeah do you have more grace for people yeah and he goes well those are fruits of my spirit come on. so keep going and so without that anchoring, without that ability to go and connect with Jesus, mm. to connect into his spirit, then I, I just think it just becomes part of the head and the head gets really confused very quickly. And then I just meet so many. It's just like they fall off the cliff constantly. Yeah. You, you hear that they were involved in grace and now they're agnostic or they were involved in grace and now they're atheists. And unfortunately, that's why then the rest of the church points in and goes, see, it doesn't work. You guys start to go in that direction of god just including everyone and then you just leave your faith altogether but it, it it's not true for those who've been baptized in the spirit they they hold their ground right so yeah it's because yeah. it's hard it's hard to go through the deconstruction process very very challenging so yeah that, that's a that's a that's a, a future series i want to do with different people is about deconstruction because I think yeah, it, there's not yeah. enough conversation about it and people's experiences, you know, because yeah, yeah, you know, there needs to be way more. Yeah, people just being raw about their stories, you know, about deconstruction. Yeah. Because 
Yeah. If you're if you are starting on that road of deconstruction and you don't have any voices around to encourage you, okay, this is perfectly normal. Yeah. Then it's right. it's going to be a yeah. harder journey. And you know, yeah. uh, that that's yeah. that's a that's a, a future podcast series I want, I want to do with different yeah, guests because sure. I think yeah. But anyway, that's, that's really cool. But bunny trail. There you go. There's there's a, there's a, there's a fr- so <laughs> um so sort of the first question is really um a really basic one in the prophetic what do you do you feel is like the number one key for unlocking the prophetic for someone who doesn't think they're prophetic well i mean i i think we touched on a little bit um and i was saying this too earlier so we won't go down this road too much but i i was saying how you know, really, I, I mean, you have to be solid in in your theology. And, and we were touching a little bit on eschatology, but saying, you know, your eschatology is always going to guide or inform your your theology. And theology is is always going to be the basis of how you move in the prophetic, how you prophesy. So really simply put, if your eschatology is you know, nuclear bombs and, you know, seven headed dragons with whores and, you know, and that that's your focus at the end of the world. Right. And you're trying to avoid the mark of the beast. So you're not getting vaccinated. You know, it's like when you're going down that road, then the problem is, is that all your prophecy will be about, you know, Donald Trump and the Republican party getting in. Right. And so that, that is what becomes problematic. And the truth of it is that all the major American prophets prophesied Trump would get in and he didn't. And then they were all lost and, mm. and they lose their anchor and they lose their way. And then people doubt their ministries because, you know, here's the problem. When the kingdom of God, you try to blend it with the kingdoms of men. When you try to blend empire with kingdom. Come on. Oh, man. That's what Come Jesus on. was saying in Revelation about being lukewarm is, is you're mixing the hot and the cold right? It's like, you, you got to go one way or the other. You want to be a politician, be a politician. You want to be a kingdom guy or woman, then you be that. Okay. But you, you, you start blending that stuff, then you, you start to follow empire yeah. and instead of following Jesus. And I, Brian Zahn puts it the best. He said, I don't follow lambs, or sorry, he said, I don't follow elephants or donkeys. I follow a lamb, right? And, yeah. and that's, so, so that has to be the foundation. And then there has to be deep intimacy, like praying in the spirit Come is, on. is everything is, it, this is my opinion, because I, I, it's hard to make a solid case for it in scripture. I would say it says that he who pre, uh, prays in the spirit edifies himself. And that mm-hmm. word in the Greek means to build a house, right? Yeah. And so you're building a house of the prophetic gifts. And this is why I believe Paul makes a point that he said, yeah, great. I wish, you know, you, you, you all speak in tongues. That's great. But I wish you would prophesy. And he's making the point, not that a prophecy is better than tongues, but he's saying that, look, all of you should be praying in tongues anyway. Like that's just the common gift. So, yeah. so to me, it is what draws you into the deeper things of the spirit. You move in worship. And, and one thing I learned to do early on is what Paul says is that I, I sing in the spirit and I sing with the understanding I pray in the spirit and I pray with the understanding. And so that's something I practice a lot is that when I am worshiping, I I'm usually praying in the spirit to the English songs, but then I'm praying in English in my head. Now, Paul says the reason to do that. So your mind doesn't be unfruitful. And I think most people who are spirit filled have experiences where you sit down to pray in the spirit and And then you stop praying in tongues, you know, or you start praying in tongues again, and then you start thinking about work or you start thinking about other yeah. things and your mind just shuts off and you stop praying the spirit. So one thing that I learned to do is pray in the spirit out loud. And then I pray in English in my head, you know, so, and yeah. often I find those things begin to mirror each other, you know, yeah. um, I'll start praying in the spirit. And then all of a sudden I get something in English, which is in some ways also part of the gift. I start interpreting it in my praying, mm. um, just even for yourself. So, so I really feel that, you know, having a solid grace doctrine is imperative to really move in true prophetic. Um, you know, 
and and understanding that the and the other thing I kind of because there's I mean you could just I could unpack this over 40 podcasts <laughs> you know one thing that I find is so important with the prophetic that gets so missed is it's like I, I find that the prophetic movement is like um, America's Got Talent or Britain's Got Talent. It's like everyone's competing to get the Vegas show. It's like mm. everyone wants to have the bigger, better prophetic word. It's like, well, yeah. I prophesied COVID. And it's like, well, I prophesied COVID and the end of the world. You know, it's <laughs> like everyone's trying to up the ante of having the better, more climat- you know, more climactic ending prophetic word. Mm. And I honestly, again, this is my opinion. I honestly don't believe that is the gift of prophecy for the New Testament church. Um, it's like everyone's still trying to be Isaiah and Jeremiah. And yeah. that idea of that kind of office prophet, um, I, I just don't, I, I don't really lean towards that um, as much anymore because it turns into a competitive thing. And, and it, and, and don't forget, God hasn't called you or called me to be the voice piece for an entire nation. But in the Old Testament, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah spoke to the king for the whole nation of Israel. We're not in that position. So and one story I'll tell you is that in, in my early days, uh, when I was still in my 20s, when I was still developing the gift, is the Lord early on, I was in Bible school you know, in Saskatchewan, Canada. And, uh, and in this little town that had a bank and a, a, and a corner store, we get Slurpees that, that, and that was it. And, uh, so, so I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm praying one day, and this was before the first Gulf war, uh, started with, um, George Bush senior and the Lord clearly i just spoke to me and told me when the gulf would, war would start to the day the day that it would start and it started on that day about two weeks later and then the war went on and i was still at school and then i was praying again one day and the lord said this is when it's going to end and it ended on that day and and so great awesome i knew those dates and so i said to the lord what was the point of that like mm-hmm. i i don't have a hotline in uh, mr bush uh, it's like the Lord told me, you know, no, no one was listening to me. I was just a kid. Um, and so the Lord was showing me, you know, it absolutely doesn't matter, but I'm just showing you to know that you should pay attention when I'm telling you things, because I'll tell you things if you're listening. So it wasn't for me to go and share that with anyone. It was just for me to know yeah. that the radio was working, you know, yeah. that the, the antennas and the station was tuned. So I needed to pay attention for further episodes, you know, as they, yeah. as they would come and, and they did. And so I think that when the heart is, I just want people to find the love and grace of God. How can I speak to their potential? How can I speak to the future? Mm-hmm. And you, and you, so you think of Ezekiel prophesying to bones he wasn't dealing with the future. And that's what we got to get out of our head about the prophetic. Stop trying to predict the future mm. and start telling people what their future could be if they would walk into the things of God. Start speaking into the potential. And, and you, then you can't be really wrong. And as you move in that, God will fill in the color to get more detail. But that's kind of how you start. Just start actually with a word of encouragement you see somebody have a gift in mary begin to prophetically speak into that gift encouragement Mm. and life just like ezekiel was speaking life and encouragement into those bones and they and and they came to life he wasn't saying all the bones will raise and in the year 782 it will you know it wasn't about a future it was actually the whole thing was a metaphor and a vision so it didn't matter so I mean, it mattered. <laughs> it did not matter. <laughs> Ezekiel 37 didn't yeah. matter, really. No, it's just, you know, it, 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 didn't, didn't, matter. it didn't matter. Yeah. You know, okay. I'll, so please know, everybody, Matt Klein's happy yeah. for you to tear out Ezekiel yeah. 37 because apparently, according to Matt Klein, it doesn't matter. Uh, no. I'm We're going to be on John Piper's web, his webcast. Oh, dude. John Piper's going to take a clip of this and say, they don't think it's Ezekiel. Hey, <laughs> I'll take that as a promotion of the gospel. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. 
<laughs> no, I, I think what you were saying there about, and this is going back a little bit because I don't like to talk about politics too much because I think what you yeah, spoke, yeah. what you said was really key. And you talked about the, the yeah. hot water and the cold water mixing makes it look yeah. warm. And actually yeah. God gave me a similar word probably about five years ago because I, I big in, I, in my natural self, I love politics. I find it hugely interesting. I, I, I'm yeah. turned on by politics because I think it affects everything mm-hmm. about life. And then mm-hmm. um, a, a mentor of mine was saying, Ed, you know, you, either God's calling you to politics or he's calling to the kingdom, make a choice. Right. And, yeah. I, and in my yeah. head, I'm like, ah, screw you. No, I'm going to still do both because I am rebellious <laughs> by nature. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then Holy Spirit spoke to me probably probably two or three months later, and he took me to the scripture yeah. where it talked about the disciples were with Jesus, and they say, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And yeah. Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know the times and seasons the Father has put in his own control. Right. And God yeah. so, spoke to me so clearly, he says, stay out of politics, Ed. Yeah, yeah. And it just... I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, because here's the thing. I, I don't... So so let's add to that. Let's build that out a little bit. Because yeah. I, I think that what the Spirit is saying in all that is stay out of the politics of the world and get involved in the politics of the kingdom because my politics are grace for everyone salvation for everyone healing for everyone restoration and reconciliation for everyone so so your politics have to be about the things that really impact and change the world and just it's like i have got so many people in my life that are deep conspiracy theorists right and and God bless him. I mean, whether you think the moon was towed here or the earth is flat or there's microchips and vaccines, I don't know how they I don't know how they think we got all that tech, but you can just get a ten dollar microscope and yeah, anyway, but it's like all of that stuff, and I say to them often, I go, Okay, so let's say there's evil in the world and everyone's faking it and the, you know and nasa and all the doctors and, and and everyone's in and they're all getting paid then the light will expose the darkness but the kingdom of god will still expand so you don't have to yes. worry about it come on it's like just affect the world you're in love the, your neighbor as yourself reach come on. help the people around you speak into their lives encourage yeah. them build them up and don't worry about what the illuminati is doing because it may or may not exist and if it does it's just run by the devil and the people involved don't even know <laughs> so it's like just just do your thing now if you wake up tomorrow and you go to work and you run into Bill Gates and he's your best friend all of a sudden, then prophesy into his life and encourage him to build him up. Like it just, so if God puts you in a place to have influence over things and blow open conspiracies, then expose the darkness. But, but sitting at home on your internet, you know, reading stuff, it's just going to make you depressed and it just makes you part of the problem instead of being part of the solution. So this, this is what Jesus said. You're in the world, but don't be of it because you're aliens. You're you're like sojourners that are just passing through. Like, mm-hmm. and so if an alien lands and gets off the ship, you know, he doesn't run around going, "Hey, you guys know that this is a conspiracy." Or he doesn't care because no. he's leaving Wednesday, and they're they're going to Neptune. They they don't really care about what's going. And so we kind of have to have that mentality that you know, we're terraforming this earth to be the kingdom of God, and so we have to be about that. And not get sucked in to the antichrist way that wants to lure us into power that we think we have, right? Mm-hmm. And and we're so funny, especially because it's the charismatics that get the most involved in politics and the Baptists, really. I mean, in fairness, but they really get involved. And and at some point, you got to step away and say, like, if we really believe what we're preaching, then the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mm-hmm. but they are spiritual. Yeah. for the tearing down of strongholds so yeah. i can't do that by doing law like and and i it's such a conundrum right like we preach that we're free from the law and then we would get we want to get involved in politics so that we can control the law so that that we can enforce spirituality so that we can tell people that we're free from the law so that we can go forth get involved in politics so we can enforce the law to tell people they're free from yeah. the law and that's why it doesn't work 
yeah. that's the suck in of Come on. antichrist thinking you know so. that's good that's really good you know i i always i've said this for a long time christians are against muslim sharia, sharia law but they would love christian right. sharia law there you go you know, yeah. and, and I think I, that's, I, I said this that's, to the, that's the, the deception. Day. That's the deception. It is. I said, I put this on Facebook the other day. I said, I did these series of like posts that I'd say oops at the end, you know, because <laughs> it's like, we believe this. Oops. We believe this. Oops. You know, but I said, I said, here it is. The Jewish people are waiting for their Messiah to come back to set up his kingdom and destroy his enemies so that they can take over the world. Christians are waiting for their Messiah to come back, to set up his kingdom, to destroy his enemies, to put them in power over the whole world. And then I wrote, oops. Like, if you really pay attention, our belief system in Judeo-Christianity is identical to what the Jews are believing. And we're like, you're wrong, follow Jesus. And we're doing exactly the same thing. So when we get caught up in all of that, instead of just the person next to us, and I'll tell you why we don't, because that's just not sexy. Yeah. It, it's far more sexy to know who's going to be the next president. And God told you. And so this mm -hmm. all relies on ego. It's all flesh. And that's how the enemy gets in and deceives people and why big name prophets in the U.S. were all wrong, because it's all about feeding the ego. God told me I'm connected. I know this guy. I know that guy. I know celebrities. I'm prophesying this and that. No, God just wants you to go to find someone in the church who's struggling and broken and begin to speak life and Come prophesy on. into their future. But people don't want to do that, right? They want the sexy stuff. But I'll tell you what, you can get to the sexy stuff. But when you get there, because I've gotten that stuff and I don't care because who's listening anyway? God doesn't matter because God's tormented me actually with with the prophetic because he tells me stuff that if I told people they weren't going to believe me and then it happens and I'm like I, I knew that <laughs> no one cares right? yeah. no one was listening anyway so one time I was driving with my wife we were driving by a church in our city and I said to her just it just came on me out of the blue I said I wonder it was a big church in our city and I said I wonder what the congregation's going to do when they find out he's having He's having affairs, like plural. She's like, oh, that's a horrible thing to say. I said, I know, right? That was horrible. I shouldn't have said that. You know, So we just kept driving. And a week later, uh, my sister-in-law called and said, did you hear what happened? I said, no. I said, turns out Pastor's has been having an affair with multiple women and the whole church blew up. Mm. And it's just like, what do you do with that stuff, right? And again, it's just one of those things that, yeah, I wasn't meant to do anything with it. It had already occurred. It was already happening. It's yeah. just, and again, this is more, you could argue, it's more of a word of knowledge, right, than it is prophetic. But but the gifts of spirit are so intermixed because when you're giving a prophetic word, you're often giving a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom at the same time, performing yes. miracles and bringing yeah. healing. So they're all working together for good. Percent. That's the purpose. Yeah, yeah t totally. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. Yeah no yeah. wow that was that was like one question um, and we that was awesome so so so, so 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 uh, i want the audience to know before the podcast matt's like well I, i'm not sure i've got much to say you know uh, we'll just see how it goes well bless him <laughs> i think he's got plenty to say and i don't know about anybody watching but if you please put comments put your questions below and um, because we're going to get matt on another podcast put your questions below so we can we can use that to craft some future interviews because i don't know about you but i'm i'm getting stuff from this today it's really confirming stuff in my heart and it's really encouraging me so i'm sure everybody who's watching is feeling the same so okay um we're gonna we'll do this we'll do a question two and then we will come <laughs> back for part two um because okay. and, okay. and then in part two guys which is going to be next week is going to be focused on how can you as a prophetic person work with your local pastor and also what can local pastors do to work with you because it's not just a one-way street and I, and I, for me that's my heart because over the years i have struggled in that area because of my own insecurity and because of my own 
soul issues i've really struggled to connect um in that sort of way at times and so i think that's a really valuable thing for perfect so part two next week please keep an eye out for that but this 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 last question we may go another 30 minutes with this one question who knows matt it's all good in the glory um (laughs) (laughs) what's the most valuable lesson god has taught you through your journey in the prophetic oh wow yeah i know yeah wow okay so i'll back it up so i was probably 24 at the time now this isn't going to seem to do with the prophetic ray at the beginning but i'll i'll get you there um so this was kind of the beginning of deconstruction i mean it was already slowly happening in my heart in different in different areas but you know, I was question. I was starting to question this wrathful, vengeful God. You know, and I had lot. I let go of a lot of that already, but mm. but still, it was still ingrained in me. So, anyways, I'm 24. I'm preaching in this church. It was my home church, and it was my turn to preach. And 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 the pastor really loved me. And my parents are sitting in the front row. We've got a packed house, and I am just laying it on thick. You know, because my my background too is drama, theater. I've done tons of musicals, and mm-hmm. so I really act when I'm preaching. And 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 now it's more just half stand up comedy and half trying to get serious mode. <laughs> it's like half I'm parsing Greek verbs on the board, and the other half is I'm just making people laugh their heads off. Right? So it's and then we eat donuts, right? It's some some mix like that. But anyway, so I'm preaching. I'm laying it down. And I'll never forget the sermon. It's like the worst moment of my life now when I think back. But uh, I was talking about the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. And I said, you know, Jesus is up on the cross and he's naked and dying and bleeding for you. Nobody could even recognize him, beaten beyond recognition. And you say, I'm bored. I want to go to the bar. And that's what Jesus did for you. And that's your response. How many know you've got to get right with God and, you know, and people are crying and, you know, it's a big drama. My parents are clapping. The pastor's clapping. Everyone is just like, that was awesome. They're lined up after, you know, that was so powerful. And I remember it back in those days, it was like, oh, pastor is such a good word. I just felt the conviction of the spirit, you know? And so that's how we judge good words is, it made me feel like crap. You know? So that's how we knew it was good. Like, that's really bizarre when you come to grace. And, you know, so, and, and this is like almost a definitive moment of, about how you know that God's even there at all, that he exists. So I am in utter jubilation. I am so proud of myself. I'm like, I killed it. And people were touched and the spirit moved. And as we're packing up our stuff, I, w- I walked around the back of the stage and I, I literally felt God just arrested me. It's like he pinned me against the wall. And he said, don't you ever do that again. And I was like, uh, were you not just in there? I killed it. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> He's like, no, I, I left halfway through. <laughs> he, <was> like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, he said to me, <laughs> he said, all you did today was beat up my kids come on and you didn't make them know my love and i'm like what Mm. and i knew he was right and i had nothing to come back with Mm. because i knew it was the lord what are you gonna say well in in john 4 you know it's like that conversation's over it's like the lord just ended me and that was so unraveling Mm. because i'm like how am i so wrong how are my parents wrong? How's my pastor wrong? How, how did I think I hit it and I completely missed it? Mm. And that just kind of just opened up a journey that eventually my wife and I, then I got married a few years after that. And I remember we finally left church altogether for about four years. And I was... I was really distressed because we hadn't been in church a long time. And I said, Lord, I, I, I said to her one night, I said, I just wish Jesus would come tell me to stop being silly and stop being rebellious, mm-hmm. as you were saying earlier, and just go back to church and smarten up. And just mm-hmm. stop all this silliness because we just felt we couldn't be there anymore. Something was going on. Anyway, 
I said, I wish he would just come and rebuke me and I could just get over this and we just go back to church and life is normal. And anyways, that night, um, she had a dream that we were at this conference and this guy was preaching and he said, does anyone have a prophetic word? And in her dream, this 10 year old boy stood up and said, I do. And I, I'll probably get it wrong, but he said something like it was Jeremiah, like six, nine or six, eight. And, uh, and, and the word was, um, they reject the word of the Lord. So what kind of wisdom do they have? They say peace, peace when there is none. Priests and prophets alike are all greedy for gain. They dress the wounds of my people saying peace, but there is none. And so then the Lord says, where is the balm of Gilead? Where is the healing for, for my people? Mm. And in her dream, the boy says, Jeremiah 6, 8. And he goes, yeah, sit down. We don't want to hear that word. No, no. She wakes up and we're like, what does Jeremiah 6, 8 say? <laughs> so we're, look, we're looking it up. And it exactly says they reject the word of the Lord, which is exactly what happened in her dream. And she hadn't read that passage before. That evening, uh, a, a very prophetic friend of ours called and said, I was thinking about you last night and the Lord gave me Jeremiah 8, 9. So we're like, so weird. We were just in Jeremiah. So we look it up. It's the identical message repeated from chapter six to chapter eight. They dress the wounds of my people. They reject the word of the Lord. Oh man. And we were just like, what do we do with that? Right. And, and so it just gave us peace that we were doing the right thing that we were, we, we were out for a season to begin to understand grace and then, and then go back in. Uh, and then we went back into a meat grinder. It was very, very painful going back. And then we eventually started our own church. But um, what was your question again? <laughs> no, I, I, I think I went dude, off. I it's, went off, Mark. It's it's all it's good. It's good. Um, yeah, you're asking me about the foundation of the prophetic. Well, no? the, just a, a valuable lesson God has taught you in the journey of prophetic. But actually, I think what you're touching yeah, on there yeah. about grace is is so important. And yeah. it, and it almost brings us. So back it was to... learning the grace of God. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It was really experiencing that and going deeper because the more that we let go of judgment because you know i mean anyone who's involved in prophetic know that the words prophetic and judgment are like synonymous they all go together and and one of the biggest revelations i had in grace is that there is you know and people say yes god is love but he's also just i hear that all mm -hmm. the time god's love but he is just and i go well, that's funny because it's not listed as one of the fruits of the spirit and yet everyone says that and it's like <laughs> one of the fruits of the spirit is not that god's just it's like what but what you need to understand is that yes god is but god's love is just god's kindness is just god's generosity is 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 just his goodness is just his long suffering is just that is how God is just, is that he loves his enemies. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes as the physician to heal of all of our disease, which is shame and guilt and fear. And so when you understand that in the prophetic, that's your foundation, that you are always setting out to speak healing to people that are bound by the disease of shame, fear, guilt, and the lie of rejection. And so all prophecy needs to be informed by that hermeneutic. The hermeneutic of Jesus is a great position because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus in you, right? You're baptized into his spirit, right? And so when you are ministering from that hermeneutic of healing, then the only judgment is that God has judged sin and shame and guilt and separation on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's what he judged on the cross. His justice was my children are sick and that's evil. And so I'm going to end that, you know, that is the justice of God against the disease, right? Punishing the disease. And so when that informs your prophetic, when that is the foundation, then you just stop judging because, and people say, and this happens in grace against grace people all the time. They're like, oh yeah, the end times have prophesied this, that in the end, that they would just listen to message that tickle their ears. Let, let me tell you something. <laughs> The message of grace and forgiveness towards people is not ear tickling. No. <laughs> that's why that's why movies with Liam Neeson like Taken do very well because those are ear tickling. It's 
full of vengeance and wrath. You took my daughter. I will find you and I will kill you. I mean, and we go, yeah, give me more popcorn, right? I like that. I like, he's killing everyone. This is awesome. All those sex slave traders. That's awesome. Kill them all. Kill them bad. Kill them in bad ways. Hallelujah. Right. And so we like that because it tickles the flesh. It Come arouses on. our violent passions, mm -hmm. right? And in Greek, this is what we call the orge. And I don't know if you know this, it's very trippy. When you start to read some of the Greek, there are parts in the New Testament where it says the wrath of God, mm -hmm. and it's it's a total lie. Because when you look in the Greek, the on theos is not even in the text. It just says orge. It means that we have been... We are experiencing the passions, it says, mm. the, the, the passion of the flesh. It's not of God. It doesn't say the wrath of God. It just says the wrath. We come under our own wrath, right? And so when we enjoy a, a, a climactic ending of God blowing up stuff and mm. destroying the enemies, which is exactly what Israel wanted, which all led them to Gehenna because... The Romans put them there while they were burning Jerusalem and Jesus warned them that would happen, right? And, and so the same warning is to the church today. When you want wrath and violence against your enemies yeah. or one political party over another, you're going to start to prophesy and you're going to be a false prophet because we got tons of false prophets in the church right now because, again, they're, they're being impacted and influenced by a spirit of antichrist and empire. Yeah. But when you divorce yourself from that and say, no, I'm just going to be a minister of healing and hope. Mm. Yeah. But so it's not ear tickling. No. Because even I'm sure people are listening to this and go, oh, that's boring. I I was hoping to get a prophetic word about when the next hailstorm or earthquake was going to be. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. How about prophesying to the next Justin Bieber? How about how about prophesying to some kid in your church who's supposed to be a, another mega celebrity that's yeah. going to save thousands of kids from suicide uh, yeah. that that's amazing totally. right and so totally anyways that's no I, it, that's my opinion on that it's and i think that's so important about you know because some of my concerns around the prophetic movement is without grace it becomes like dungeons and dragons you know <laughs> that's so awesome that it, you would say that that's it, so it, awesome. it becomes this yeah chasing things that have no real impact you know, and I said this about five years ago on, on a video I did about the prophetic, and it was this is the quote, and it, I still love it. It says, "Real prophecy has impact in the real world." Yeah. Absolutely. Don't don't tell me how many angels you saw or how many dragons you've become friends with in the spirit, <laughs> unless that has a demonstrable, fruitful yeah. impact in the earth. That's right. You know, have you I, met my spirit dragon? Yeah. <laughs> this is my spirit dragon. Oh, dude, I, 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 I've, I've met, oh, I've met some people somewhere in the world. I can't say where, and they would start yeah. talking to me about how they make friends with dragons and the spirit. Awesome, that's great. Good, good for you. Ah, <laughs> uh, what? What, what do you win what, what, what do you win for that well, but, but you know th and this has always been my issue with the prophetic is what oh, good man. is that you're How a level does... 10 prophet you've got your own personal dress. exactly and it you know and the prophetic should always be have an impact i always think about the woman at the well you know yeah, well that, that that's for me is there's that... the prophetic at work right there that's really for... unsexy just that's for Just me is is a really good template for word of knowledge prophetic ministry jesus didn't yeah. shame the woman and yeah. why do we always assume the woman was a whore because it says right. she had five husbands and the man she's living with is now a husband yeah. but i remember here i yeah. was list i was reading a um john paul sanford wrote a book called um elijah mm -hmm. task many years ago a 1970s yeah. book you probably read it you know no doubt because it was around yeah. the time you know because you're that old <laughs> My oldest friend. <laughs> I just not known you very yeah, long. I, um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, and in that book, he says, "Why do we assume the woman was an adulteress? Why do we assume she was a bad right. person?" Because, and he laid out the case that maybe she was married to a guy. He dies, and what does happen in Jewish yeah. culture? Kingsman Redeemer. 
the next brother have right. to take her on right. and what if this yeah, woman and he didn't like her and exactly yeah. and this process went on yeah. for this woman that she was out of control of but you know so, but so often in the natural inclination is when we when we read that scripture is to sh- assume the worst of the the person and when right. god gives us a prophetic right. word we assume the judgment we assume the shame we assume the guilt we assume all that negative stuff when actually yeah. jesus didn't get involved in that right he then or she was like wanting to get into a theological conversation and she was like jesus okay. our father said we should worship here your father said what should we do and jesus is like you missed the point woman it's not about <laughs> and so he avoided the theological conversation he avoided the right. shame conversation yeah. because there was no shame to have had because jesus has right. done it all and then he just yeah. and she just goes away impacted wow this man knew me and right. she went right. and she then from that place of being transformed and encountering the grace of god yeah. well i think you just absolutely hit the nail on the head is that the true mark of the prophetic is to make people feel known by god totally. that's the whole point yeah people go you just read my mail god must know me yeah like god god must be real and i mean this is what happens so often i i remember one day <laughs> my wife always hates us so <laughs> we were at a coffee shop and i saw this businessman drinking his coffee and we're just sitting there and it's funny because like when I train people in this and even how I had to train myself was I saw him and it's like right away. I'm like, oh, the Lord wants to talk to him. And then you go, nah, I just making that up because that will be awkward. And, and and the Lord had to say to me one day, you really think you're just having coffee and you're just out of the blue makeup. I'm going to go over to that and then across the restaurant because that person needs a word from the Lord. He goes, nobody makes that up. No. Because nobody wants to do that. So if it ever drops in your heart, it's because I want you to say something. I'm like, okay, fair enough. So I now I warn my wife. I'm like, um, like we're going. So you might want to just go in the car because I got to talk to this guy, right? So we we left the restaurant. I get her in the car. She's like, okay, I, you know. So he actually came out at the same time. Goes and sits in his BMW, and uh, I'm like, ah. So I walk over and knock on the window. He kind of looks at me and rolls it down. I said, hey, uh, it's always hard to start these conversations. Hi, I'm a weirdo. Um, I'm not going to mug you. (laughs) You I I said, hey, I just saw you sitting in there. And I said, uh, sometimes I just get these things for people. And I just feel God wants to say something to you. And would you be open to that? And I'll never forget. He he had his hands on the steering wheel. He's looking at me and he goes, okay. (laughs) <laughs> i'm like oh you've run into people like us before you know it's like you just he was not expecting anything good right and it was so beautiful because i said to him the lord wants you to know he sees how hard you work mm. for your family he sees the hours and the hours that you have sacrificed and given up to work hard. And while others have called you a workaholic, God calls you favored and blessed. And he sees the sacrifice and he's going to make up to you the years that you feel that has been stolen to you. And he looks at me and his eyes are just swollen, tears running down his face. Right. And then I said, all right, have a nice night. And I left him. <laughs> I walked away, something like that. Right? And, uh, and he would just, he just said, thank you so much. Like, and in that moment, he felt known yeah. by God, yeah. right? He was expecting judgment, yeah. but instead he received grace, right? Oh. He received the love of God, which is what we all want. Mm-hmm. We all want our enemies to get the judgment words, but then we want the words filled with grace and mercy, yeah. right? It's like, yeah. it's so funny, but you know, and I, I've seen that over and over again. And that's just the real on the ground, everyday, practical, prophetic yeah. that, yeah. that, you know, and it should be so natural that you sometimes don't even know you're doing it. Yeah. And I've done that preaching. Like I've just pointed someone out, use them as an example. And then I'm, I pause and I'm like, oh yeah, by the way, that was for you. That was like a word. And then we, we just move on. I do it all the time. Right. People are like, oh yeah, no, that's good. 
And um, it should just be so natural. And I, I find, again, back to praying the spirit, that the more that you do that, you just begin to live a spiritual life. So you are led by the spirit. You are guided by the spirit. You have spiritual encounters. And then you say spiritual words. And you're always in the mode of giving thanksgiving and encouraging people. And so you live a prophetic lifestyle rather than looking to be a prophet, right? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the ego side yeah. that you've got to let go, you know, yeah. just got to let it go. Definitely. No, that's, that's awesome, Matt. Um, I mean, we've, we've, we've gone long 50 minutes, so we are going to call mm. it quits mm. for, for, for this okay. episode. But yeah. it's um, just to pick on that last point, I want to. I read a book when I was 16 called The Angel and the Judgment by Don Norrie Sr., uh, okay. who was the founder of Destiny Publishing. And he wrote this parabolic book about this preacher who came preaching the judgment of God. And the judgment's mm. coming, the judgment's coming, the judgment's coming. And then one day, an angel comes to him and says, Okay, God says you can pronounce the judgment. What is it? Oh. And he says, And he was thrown. But he steps up to the plate and he says, "Okay, bring this judgment." And he bring and he release and he and in this dream in this encounter he speaks this stuff out and it all happens. But what happens is he gets caught up in the judgment and he gets judged along with everybody else. And he wow. and he ends up being really destitute and really broken. And and this angel comes back and, and he was really angry at the angel. He says, "Well, wh why am I caught up in it?" And he says, "Why?" Did, and the angel's like, "Why did you think you would miss out on the judgment that you pronounced?" Do you think you're better than right, any of these people? Exactly. And yeah. I remember re I'm, I'm doing a really, really bad retelling of this book. So I would no, recommend no. it no, to I every guess. prophetic person because it was, as a, wow. as a 16 year old boy, I just sobbed reading the book because so often, as you said, we want the judgment on our enemies and we want grace to ourselves yeah. when actually yeah. we, sh we should judge ourselves and give grace to our enemies, you know? And yeah. it's it was such an impactful thing. It's just thing. too bad. It's just too bad there wasn't a scripture about this. Like it would have been really good if Jesus would have said something like, <laughs> by the same measure you judge, you will be judged. Like if only that was a scripture, that but, would have been You know, so Jesus helpful. Jesus never spoke about that sort of thing, you know? He was too busy no. talking about he his was pet busy, dragon. Though. He was too busy he talking about his dragon. dragon. You know? <laughs> like, he was too busy talking about pet dragons. He was busy dragons. with bread and fish. He was doing some fish sticks and oh i mean you know he was just a he was just a local <laughs> magician you know it was the, it was the it was the just, stuff that's not written in the yeah. word that we need to really pay attention <laughs> to matt you know but that's anyway right. now that's we're right. poking fun <laughs> um but i want to thank you matt for being on right. this first yeah. episode it's You're been welcome. so thank much you. fun dude so much fun awesome um thank every... you so much a pleasure man everybody else um check out matt Klein on facebook if you want to be offended on a daily basis please check out his facebook you will be <laughs> offended and transformed by it i know i am so i would really highly oh, recommend man. his post to you That's good. um and mm. we're gonna get matt again back on another broadcast so thank you very much for watching guys bye bye, thank you. bye.